I'd like to introduce the leaders of the research who will be presenting the results. Mr. Sergei Bolshakov, who represents Microsoft. Karen Kazarian, the chief analyst of Russian um, Association for Communications. And also Maria Saikina, the analyst from this association and um, the representative of Bakery Mackenzie, Vadim Perival. The research was hosted by Microsoft and McKenzie with the support from Zberba. Before handing the floor to my colleagues, I'd like to make a short intro. National strategy for AI in Russia determines regulation as one of the key aspects for development of this technology in Russia. The concept of this technology regulation shows key guidelines, key directions for the development. And uh, one of the key, one of the major issues of the concept is how to delegate. How to delegate decision making legally significant decision making, how to, how to delegate the making of legally significant decisions to algorithms. Let me put it simply. This is the issue of the broad use of uh, AI decision making in in um, civilian circulation, in civil circulation, civil law transactions. This is uh, not only legal, but also economic and social research. Andre, thank you very much for the intro. We have heard many opinions today about ethic and moral sides of AI, specifically what uh, the AI is allowed to do. Practically, one of the layers of this regulation is, of course, the administration of law between AI and humans. And there, there is no morals in there. It's all, all of this is drawing up to human rights and social good. And of course, that's um, described both in national legislation and in compliances of corporations. Uh, there are certain ambiguities regarding the development of new technologies. Therefore, leading AI developers are joining international dialogue. And I would like to thank Andrei Niznama personally for his contribution into our research. Speaking of the principles and aspects of our research and AI, Anna Abramova from Mgimo University was speaking about that as well. Here are the main uh, research domains for AI. This is the classification of Harvard University. And uh, the classification that is applied in Microsoft is pretty similar. Privacy, accountability, safety and security, transparency and explainability. And of course, all of this should be based on uh, uh, fundamental human values and human rights. At the first stage of our research, we are we have been asking questions what are the norms that prevent ai from being used ethically at the next stage after first expert discussions we were going to study actual cases of how ai is being applied and therefore provide suggestions on how decision making can be better delegated to ai we have selected four domains of smart city city management healthcare finance and retail and administrative governance. My colleagues will be talking about the results. Maria will be firstly talking about the practical hands-on legal aspects of AI regulations in decision making. Ms. Vadim will be talking about different industrial approaches and it will be concluded by different blocks that prevent the use of AI in decision making and what we can do about those blocks. On the next Next slide, I would like to just highlight that we have uh, thoroughly researched Russian and international white papers regarding um, AI regulation. 
and we have specifically um, have one spot vacant so any of the participants of today's discussion can actually take that spot now I would like to hand the floor to Maria Saikina Sergey thank you very much good evening I think my part of the presentation will be more of an intro a preamble to my colleagues presentations so let me talk about what decision making is per se and what are the specific traits of how the decisions are made by human beings as opposed to the way the AI does it and why we need to regulate the algorithms of decision making at all so usually decision making is a cognitive process of selecting uh, from a range of alternatives that choice is based on beliefs knowledge values of the actor which is making a choice and making a decision henceforth but algorithms uh, have uh, certain advantages and disadvantages as opposed to human beings there are five main classifications of those advantages and disadvantages obviously algorithms um, have advantage when they need to process a large number of alternatives of course algorithms can do that quicker but human beings have other advantages like for example human beings uh, can um, handle the situations much better when decision is more ambiguous and when data set on uh, uh, the selection of an option is unstructured Besides, human beings can simply be intuitive or apply common sense, unlike algorithms, which don't know what these notions could be. Um, there could be different structures for decision making with different levels of involvement if we talk about uh, social structures. There could be delegations, there could be hybrid options when uh, decision is uh, made uh, together by a human being and an algorithm. So decision making can be f fully made, but the decision can be fully made by a human being, can be fully made by the algorithm, or it can be some sort of uh, intermediary um, option. There are examples when decision making is fully delegated to AI. That's specifically applicable when we talk about dynamic pricing or uh, situations when AI simply provides recommendations. But more and more analysts claim that human involvement matters. There should always be a human observer that inspects decisions made by AI. Today, during a conference, we have seen many cases of AI delegation. AI decision making and delegation and there will be more and more cases like that mainly because um, the cases that we have today for AI decision making confirm confirm that AI can be trusted with decision making and uh, when decision making is entrusted to AI that helps to actually um, make decisions more correct and cut a lot of costs on the way but there is always a flip side to that that sort of delegation assumes quite a few issues specifically in ethical political technological and technological and legal domains there are many successful cases for this sort of delegation today for example AI algorithms have been successfully used to analyze uh, x-ray shots and for example this year Lancet magazine published the article on uh, how AI was used to do early cancer diagnosis 
algorithms actually turned out to be more, much more efficient than X-ray experts. So uh, the use of AI algorithms have helped to actually uh, re greatly reduce the number of both false positives and false negatives. But again, there is another flip side here. In Britain, for example, this year, they actually canceled the results of the high school exams because local regulators entrusted the scoring to automated systems. That backfired. Local regulator was hoping to cut uh, to decrease the emotional effect uh, from uh, unobjectiveness of professors, but turns out that the scores set by the system were significantly lower than uh, that than the ones that the real life professors would give. But the lowest scores got those students who were coming from more depressive uh, regions of the country and more uh, poor social groups, more vulnerable social groups. So you see the algorithm turned out to be much more biased to less socially protected uh, social groups. As a matter of fact, uh, Civic society does not have any clear knowledge about how algorithms are being entrusted with decision making. So there should be some sort of clarity, awareness, and regulation. So in our research, we suggested to modernize current uh, legal base for that. That sort of modernization not limit but encourage the development of innovation, AI implementation, while increasing social awareness, awareness and trust to AI decision-making systems. Of course, for that, we need to solve quite a few problems before. And uh, those are mostly hands-on tasks in a number of industries. But the tasks are mostly universal. They mostly deal with the transparency of how algorithms make decisions. Also, the decisions are sometimes discriminatory as a result of um, uh, specifics in data sets. And of course, IP protection is always an issue. There are quite a few gray areas that need to be lit up. I would like to conclude my part with this slide. It's the latest, uh, it's the slide from the excerpt from the latest State of AI uh, report. That's uh, the evaluation of the forecast made for 2020 by the report earlier, earlier the previous year. So in 2020, AI management will be the key task. And uh, the report claimed that there'll be one company who will make a strong contribution into the AI management models. Uh, that forecast did not come true because we see that in many countries they only embark on the journey of practical implementation of different norms and regulations to AI. However, there are cases of practical implementation. However, my colleague will be speaking about that in more detail. I hand the floor to Vladim, oh, sorry, Vadim Perivala from Baker McKenzie. Good day, dear colleagues. What are the conditions that are prerequisites that, to allow AI provide us with a perfect decision? When can we entrust AI with decision making instead of us? That's the question that is urgent not only in Russia. That is why on this forum we're discussing it with uh, international experts from all over the world because they talk about this all over the world. Many countries are saying to track tackle this issue. We uh, undertook quite an extensive research together with my colleagues. We studied lots of sources and here is the list of the most exciting ones. As a result, we have arrived to a conclusion that 
pretty much all of the legislation regarding AI decision-making uh, delegation actually narrows down to two main points. First and foremost, that is an attempt to protect our right to make the decision made by the AI objective, non-biased, fair, so that people would actually be able to be sure and find out that if the AI made a wrong decision, that decision could be changed or rejected if it has been unfair or biased. Another issue that's being broadly discussed in the scientific community is how to remove limits and borderlines that prevent AI from actually aiding and actively helping with decision making. To eliminate the unnecessary participation of humans in some cases. Nevertheless, we need to note that uh, when decisions are being made and when you regulate decision making, Approaches are not the same anywhere you go in the world. And uh, what are the types of regulations that we've seen? One can classify systems according to the potential threats that they represent for the humans. And then depending on whether this is a high risk system or it doesn't present a threat, some countries decide whether additional requirements need to be set for the system and for the companies and people that are operators of the system. Another possible approach is the regulation of the decision-making systems that are based on AI, depending on the level of autonomy, depending on how autonomous the system is, how autonomously it participates in decision-making, what is the extent of human involvement that will drive the answer to the question of who is to be liable and responsible for the decision made that is based on AI. If we're talking about a risk-based approach, we will see that even now many countries such as Canada, members of the EU, the United States, have either included in their legal requirements or will include requirements based on the level of risk that they presume. And if the risks are not significant, then the legislators would decide that no additional regulation is required. But if we're talking about uh, the criteria of autonom autonomy and uh, independence, various countries use various classifications of that. If we use uh, the EU as an example, they identify four levels of, autonomy, uh, of autonomy. The very first is uh, when AI is not used at all. The second situation is when uh, AI is giving us hints or recommendations, but the decisions are made by humans sitting at their dashboard and pressing a button. The third level of autonomy is uh, when uh, AI systems can make decisions on their own and implement them. But there is always a human in control who can uh, intercept uh, implementation at any moment. And uh, tangentially, they participate in decision making. Then the fourth level is when the human being uh, stands up and leaves the dashboard and allows the AI to continue making decisions on its own. But with this level of autonomy, the important requirement is the ability to monitor decisions and then, if necessary, fixing the decisions made by the AI. Similar classifications are used by other countries, such as Singapore. What's so useful and important about this approach? We can see that uh, many countries, such as India, uh, are a case where the legislators want to stimulate the introduction of more autonomous system. And in other countries, conversely, countries are more cautious, and they believe that an autonomous AI, for some cases, is uh, dangerous. For example, last year, France enacted a law that does not allow the use of uh, autonomous AI in uh, online arbitrage, when, uh, or arbit arbitration, rather, uh, that is in the judicial uh, area, where the decisions are being made about the fate of humans. Depending on how 
autonomous the system is, how independent it is in its operations, the question arises, who is going to be held responsible for the decisions uh, that the system is making, whether these are quality decisions or not? Is this someone who is sitting at the control panel, or is this someone who's decided to implement the system to begin with? Or maybe this is someone who produced the software that had a bug in it. One can say that right now a discussion is underway, and first attempts are being made, for example in the States, to transfer the responsibility off the shoulders of a, an operator at the control panel who can control what's going on to the manufacturer or the person who has implemented the AI system for decision making. You would say this is uh, science fiction. What are we really talking about here? As Maria uh, rightly put it, right now they're using quite actively AI systems to recommend doctors to uh, make a better diagnostic medical decisions. They are not replacing practitioners, but in the States, there are now more than 70 systems like this that have been rolled out and implemented, and they recommend certain things to practitioners based on AI. And there are systems where the doctors are replaced. I'm talking about the IDX DR technology, where doctors that are not specialist doctors in the, in the ophthalmology to diagnose uh, retinopathy. And uh, that is something that uh, doctors could uh, diagnose this even if they don't have a, an eye doctor in the hospital. And the system tells you that you need to go to a doctor and gives you a diagnosis if you don't have a specialist. At the same time, it tells you that the patient can come to uh, the doctor after a certain period of time, let's say in a year. But in order to move forward uh, towards creating a broader base for the use of AI systems with a varying degree of autonomy, we need to overcome certain obstacles that you can see, not just in Russia, but they are quite common in many countries of the world. And uh, what is common for all areas in terms of barriers are the following. It's the personal information legislation that was adopted without taking into consideration the emerging AI technologies, and that still needs to be adapted for broader use of such solutions, and uh, uh, the so-called anthropocentrism, a human-centric approach, uh, where they create uh, formal requirements which require the presence of humans, and not to prohibit the use of AI, but just because uh, these laws were taken into consideration without taking the future of the technological development into consideration. We have found a number of other barriers and obstacles that are present in many countries of the world, but at this point uh, in time, I would like to give the floor to my colleague Karen Kazarian, who will speak more about how things are with that in, in Russia. Good evening. This is uh, the model that uh, Vadim has just presented. Uh, is going to be used for one of those uh, subject matter areas um, that uh, would uh, take into consideration the needs of a smart city. And I'll also talk about what has already been done in Russia and what needs to be done still. We believe that in a smart city, in order to introduce delegation of tasks to AI, you need to, first and foremost, uh, uh, create the requisite infrastructure. Uh, you can break this uh, down into three stages. The first stage would be creating conditions for data collection. That would be the introduction of the IoT technology sensors and uh, uh, introduction of AI technologies uh, on on the needed basis in terms of uh, data processing coming from, uh, let's say, cameras installed around the city, not necessarily in real-time mode, with subsequent processing of the imagery. Then you would need to uh, promote the use of such practices and uh, such gadgets um, among the citizens. 
including smart sensors and smart meters. The second phase involves creating conditions for uh, the data sharing and use of data, creating platforms and marketplaces that any user can connect to, including private people and businesses, where you would uh, find it beneficial for yourself uh, to share data with the others, and uh, you would be able to get uh, state data, municipal data, and uh, share your own data with the state and with the city, something that they could uh, then use for further uh, digitalization. And finally, the final stage is uh, AI transformation. This means uh, the implementation of end-to-end -end solutions on the basis of AI and changing the principles of city management using AI, including delegation of uh, tasks. As for the other requirements for such implementation at these stages, I could uh, go through the list. We need to build, uh, which is most imp important, to create economic uh, prerequisites for consumers to promote data sharing and new technologies. This is the uh, bottleneck at personnel training. I'm talking about line personnel, and uh, of course, I'm talking about uh, hiring qualified staff to deal with that. This also means that you need to develop sandboxes for testing new technologies and for testing new legal and management practices. This also is about creating data standards and uh, promoting digital literacy. People shouldn't be afraid of AI. People shouldn't be afraid of uh, um, that their data is insecure. And that's only when you will be able to successfully introduce this technology. You also need to promote market competition. And uh, you can uh, introduce new principles of uh, regulation around data and decision making. And you need to create uh, legal frameworks for efficient, effective, and ethical application of AI. And most importantly, this involves awareness building and outreach, meaning talking to people and explaining to them what are the advantages that are borne by AI technologies. Uh, in sum, we can identify five key success factors. That means involving all interested parties and all stakeholders, and representing the public, the business community, and society at large. The other one is uh, uh, creating uh, conditions for personal training and creating new jobs. And of course, it's the uh, introduction of the new infrastructure for effective communication and uh, also for introducing hybrid and cloud-based uh, platforms for processing the data. What are the key barriers that exist for uh, the implementation of AI task delegability? Well, there is no single and uniform government approach to this, and we don't have enough standards covering this area. Business communities are limited in how they can use uh, the data that they can obtain from the state sources, and the state uh, has difficulties in using uh, the business data effectively. Uh, we don't have a proper legal status for the IoT data, especially when it comes to manufacturing industries. We, we uh, don't have solutions for liability and risk management using AI. There are also technology-based barriers that need to be overcome. We still have certain problems and difficulties with the infrastructure. Digital inequality still exists, and we don't know quite well what is going to happen with the fifth generation of uh, mobile communications, and uh, the effective infrastructure is required for the development of other technological solutions. Very often, 
leaderships, leadership in companies is not ready to change business processes and delegate functions to AI. We are quite reliant on uh, uh, shelf solutions and uh, something that business uh, do not really has a lot of knowledge of. Uh, and uh, very often they don't have a lot of in-house uh, solutions. And finally, we don't invest enough uh, funds in uh, R&D and development in particular. Then there's the third group of barriers. Uh, they are resource-based. We don't have enough data sets for AI training. We don't have enough uh, venture funding for funding startups in this field. We don't have enough experts and uh, qualified personnel in all fields associated with AI. That's very unfortunate. And uh, we have uh, a fairly low level of interest towards this topic from people. And uh, very often they are quite, uh, quite against these technologies. Uh, sometimes it's because of the awkward actions by the companies and state alike. What are the things that we have in our pipelines as regards these uh, tracks of actions? On the 1st of January of 2021, the law on uh, digital solutions and regimes uh, will come into effect and you will be able to try these solutions in sandboxes. There are certain steps that have been taken to improve uh, access to state data. Uh, general access data, something that the developers of AI can uh, get their hands on. As for the regulation of delegation, uh, what is in plans is to create uh, little frameworks for human AI interactions as well as uh, for uh, requirements and uh, for accountability purposes. As far as uh, data is concerned, there's been a lot of uh, changes that are going to be introduced by Law 152, dealing with the protection of personal data. And uh, there will be new rules introduced about uh, data anonymization and uh, the uh, personalization of data so that you could use data sets and therefore, once that is done, access to data will be simplified, both for state data and otherwise. Another thing that will be simplified, on the one hand, and duly protected on the other, is uh, going to be access to journal access data. And finally, ethics norms and standards would have to be developed for data processing and the use of uh, AI, including such a thing as uh, the delegation of tasks that are potentially impacting human lives. And these are the things that are going to be done under the Federal Artificial Intelligence Project. And I hope that those of you present here are going to participate in that. Thank you so much for your attention.